Great. Uh, thank you very much, Helen, and uh, good afternoon, everyone, at least uh, from the East Coast of the United States. Uh, my name is Sean Kanisaki, and I'm the director of the Pediatric Esophageal Center here at the Johns Hopkins Children's Center in Baltimore, Maryland. On behalf of my colleague here, Dr. Mark Slidell, and the rest of our team of providers, it is an absolute pleasure to welcome you to uh, this Johns Hopkins web webinar, which is entitled Treating and Managing Esophageal and Airway Conditions in Children, Part 1, really which focuses on esophageal disorders. Uh, at a later date, uh, to be determined, we will present Part 2, which will focus on uh, surgical airway conditions in the pediatric population. So let's get started. Uh, we both have no disclosures. In this webinar, we will discuss how uh, I like to think about the Johns Hopkins Children's Center patient care model uh, when it comes to the pediatric esophageal patient. I think three, three uh, distinguishing features of our program are that first, uh, we provide a multidisciplinary perspective. Second, uh, we strive to provide each patient with a customized approach to diagnose and treat. And third, uh, we offer the full spectrum of medical and surgical care, including minimally invasive surgery to achieve the best possible outcomes for your child. I hope these themes will resonate with you by providing uh, four examples of esophageal disorders that we often treat here at the Johns Hopkins Children's Center. Dr. Slidell will talk about severe gastroesophageal re reflux disease and achalasia. Uh, I will talk about esophageal atresia, as well as esophageal narrowings or strictures. This will be followed by a live question and answer session where we will, um, you can ask us specific questions about our program or about specific esophageal diseases affecting children. At the Johns Hopkins Children's Center in Baltimore, we, we have a team approach to esophageal care. Although I'm the director of this enterprise, our success really comes from our experienced multidisciplinary team of physicians and nurses who work in a coordinated fashion together within a truly world-class medical institution. Like pieces in a puzzle, experts from surgery, GI, uh, ENT, as well as radiology, anesthesia, and other disciplines really come together to give a clear picture of what's going on with swallowing and eating and how we can help. Really no single person in the world has the entire skill set um, that the group of faces here on this slide um, has really to help each patient. So we, we strongly think that a multidisciplinary care model is essential. Here in Baltimore, I think our esophageal care model is also different uh, and unique because, um, especially when you compare it to other large children's hospitals in the Mid-Atlantic region and even nationally. Uh, we are a major children's hospital shown here by the building on the right that is physically connected and affiliated with a major adult hospital shown uh, by the building on the left. Uh, so why is that good? Well, well, that's good because in addition to being a full service children's hospital, we are fully integrated with the Johns Hopkins Hospital and therefore really have the ability to draw uh, from our adult esophageal uh, colleagues who um, can have uh, be a tremendous resource for rare esophageal conditions in kids that actually tend to be more common in adults disorders such as achalasia and uh, patients with end-stage esophageal disease, for example. And we can draw on this wealth of uh, expertise as needed. We also have expert speech and language pathologists, as well as an aerodigestive clinic run by our ENT colleagues that is available for selected patients. The second unique care aspect of our center is that we take this team uh, effort to deliver an individualized approach with tailored solutions on every patient who is sent to us for a referral. In addition to inpatient consultation at our main campus in Baltimore City, your child can be evaluated for their swallowing or eating uh, difficulties by a pediatric general surgeon at any one of our six outpatient sites across five counties in Maryland, including Frederick, Montgomery, Howard, Anne Arundel, and Baltimore counties. We also see telehealth patients by video visit in certain cases, and we recently evaluate and treat patients from uh, all areas of the country, uh, but mainly the national capital region 
in areas as far south as the Carolinas to central and eastern Pennsylvania and up into the northeastern part of the United States. We try and coordinate clinic visits with any radiologic studies that need to be done on the same day for the convenience of families. And in selected cases, um, a critical diagnostic test uh, may require endoscopy, which is a thin, flexible camera that's placed into the mouth in the operating room under general anesthesia. Uh, this camera is then advanced into the esophagus and, and sometimes beyond to really get a clear picture of what's going on. Uh, we sometimes use uh, unique devices that only highly specialized uh, esophageal centers such as ours have, such as the endoflip device, uh, which is a type of endoscope, which can really give us a, a more detailed information about the dimensions of the esophagus, as well as functional aspects that you just can't get through other means uh, for diseases such as strictures, achalasia, uh, reflux, among others. The third aspect of our care model is that uh, we offer a wide spectrum of treatment options, which can include minimally invasive solutions like endoscopy and keyhole surgery, also known as laparoscopy or thoracoscopy. In keyhole surgery, several very small incisions are made to allow the surgeon to use special surgical instruments to fix the problem. In more complex keyhole surgery, we also have experience with pediatric robotic assisted surgery, which is a programmatic effort that's led by one of my colleagues, Dr. Alex Garcia. These minimally invasive solutions are generally preferred since they allow for faster recovery, as well as less pain for uh, any child after surgery. However, in some cases, we do acknowledge that traditional or open surgery through larger incisions is required to obtain the best possible outcome in terms of swallowing and eating. In the next part of this webinar, we have selected four specific esophageal disorders to discuss. Dr. Slidell will discuss the first disorder, which is gastroesophageal reflux disease, which is a very common disorder that sometimes uh, needs more than just a medication or two to successfully manage. I will then talk about the most common major disorder of newborns, uh, known as esophageal atresia, before Dr. Slidell and I discuss two major swallowing disorders affecting older children, namely achalasia and esophageal strictures. All right, I will uh, start by defining gastroesophageal reflux a little bit. Uh, there really are two things we're talking about here. One is uh, gastroesophageal reflux, and the other is gastroesophageal reflux disease. And in reality, all of us have some degree of reflux, and it's normal to have some degree of reflux. That's just the involuntary regurgitation of the gastric contents, uh, be it acid or bile, up into the esophagus. And we really only call it GERD when you produce significant symptoms and pathology or disease. And we'll really be focusing on the disease part of that process today. So a child with GERD may present with a combination of symptoms. And really, the exact presentation varies by the age of the child and the underlying reasons for this severe reflux they are experiencing. It can be an infant, adolescents, teenagers. We really see this in all ages of children. And the patterns are a little bit different depending on the age of presentation. Some common findings may be vomiting or respiratory infections as some of the gastric contents come up from the esophagus into the lungs. Other things like asthma or reactive airway disease are more common findings in older children. Apnea episodes we do see sometimes in infants uh, as they are lying prone a lot more than older children and older children have the benefit of gravity to, to keep that gastric contents from coming all of the way up into their esophagus, and then dysphagia and heartburn. And dysphagia is really uh, difficulty swallowing either liquids or solids. So the other thing we may find in, in the past history for a child like this is it, an adolescent may have a history of uh, failure to thrive as a newborn, where we may see that in a small child who's really had difficulty putting on weight. They may have had a diagnosis of failure to thrive in their past. So there's some things we can do uh, other than surgery 
And these are position, uh, positioning with an elevated head. So in an infant raising the head of the bed with a little bit of a wedge, for example, to help gravity prevent that reflux from coming all of the way up into the top of the esophagus. We can, vi uh, we can change the volume of feeds for an infant, give smaller, more frequent feeds and thicken the feeds to minimize the reflux. Sometimes changing the formula will make a difference. Uh, or we can introduce medications like antacids to neutralize acid or reduce the acid formation in the first place with things like H2 antagonists or PPIs. Uh, there are also, in some more advanced cases, prokinetic agents, things that will speed the transition of food from the stomach through the rest of the intestines. And sometimes that can also help uh, affect the uh, reflux. So with the evaluation and diagnosis, uh, there are a number of tools we have at our, uh, at our hands. The most common thing a child may receive early in the process would be an upper GI study. That's when we have a child have uh, them either drink some contrast or have some contrast material instilled into their esophagus and take some pictures. Unfortunately, this is not the best study for reflux, but it can find some other common causes of reflux, such as a hiatal hernia or a stricture or ulceration. So this study has a sensitivity of about 40% and a specificity for reflux disease of about 85%. If we really think this is reflux disease, another useful uh, test we can do is a pH monitoring study. As you can see, it's called a 24-hour pH monitoring study, and that's one of the biggest challenges with this test. Is a child has to have a tube through their nose into the esophagus for 24 hours so we can monitor and measure uh, the number of episodes and the duration of acid reflux episodes. It's a great test if we can get the test completed. We have good results uh, doing that test, but we can't always uh, do this in a small child. The other thing we often will do is endoscopy. In fact, almost every child would receive endoscopy before surgery. And this again is, is pretty specific for reflux uh, but we can also pick up some other things uh, like ulcerative esophagitis or strictures or eosinophilic esophagitis that we would not see on any of the studies that we've already mentioned. And then you may have heard of a test called manometry. And this it really has limited use in reflux in children. It's very useful in some other disease conditions we will talk about later. So how do we decide if a child needs surgery? Really, the key is that we've tried a lot of these other medical interventions or just these sort of lifestyle interventions like positioning of the head when a child is asleep. And then we really want to have a diagnosis established. We want to see whether there's a anatomic defect, for example, like a hiatal hernia. And this is a, a photo of a hiatal hernia. I'm sure it uh, doesn't necessarily make complete sense to all of the viewers today what you're seeing in the picture, but this is this is what a hiatal hernia looks like when we're operating uh, via minimally invasive approach. Other possibilities would be a history of congenital diaphragmatic hernia, or uh, if we find malrotation, you could have a gastroesophageal reflux disease induced stricture in the esophagus, or if a child's had esophageal atresia repair, they may have a stricture or narrowing in their esophagus. We also treat recurrent strictures, uh, alties, which are acute life-threatening events. Uh, this is in a baby where they have these apnea episodes uh, that are unclear in the beginning uh, what the source of those episodes are. And then sometimes we'll figure out that it's really reflux that's causing these episodes as acid refluxes up into the esophagus and sometimes to the lungs. And then some children with severe neurologic impairment undergo reflux surgery. And then of course, there are some patients referred to us who need a reoperation. So what we do for surgery, uh, as I mentioned, we sometimes do even in infants. And with infants, they'll have these apnea episodes or blue spells uh, and the aspiration that I've mentioned. And we'll do some of these studies to really make sure that there's either an anatomic reason like a hiatal hernia or just reflux uh, that all infants have, but some infants have worse than others. The good news with infants is they will often outgrow reflux and often not need uh, surgery. And so if we're able to wait until they're sitting upright a little bit and gravity is able to help them prevent that reflux from staying in the high esophagus, sometimes they can avoid surgery completely. 
Generally, a laparoscopic Nissen fundoplication is what we do. Almost every case, this is the approach we take. And that involves wrapping part of the stomach just below the esophagus to really recreate normal anatomy. You'll see if you go online, a lot of, um, a lot of sort of uh, concerning things you can find on the internet about reflux surgery. And I think that's when people make the mistake of not trying to recreate normal anatomy, but they take surgery perhaps a little further than needed and try and block that reflux from coming up at all. And like I said at the beginning, it is normal to have reflux. We all have some degree of reflux. So we don't want to create an abnormal uh, environment when we do surgery. Robotic surgery and laparoscopic surgery have the advantage of really much faster recovery than any open operation. Uh, we tend to use robotic surgery really more commonly in older kids, bigger kids, and with hiatal hernias uh, or redo operations because some of the advantages are uh, are greater for those than when we do left Nissen's, say, in a smaller child. The results overall are excellent, uh, especially in neurologically normal children. And uh, by excellent results, we don't mean no reflux at all. We mean normal amounts of reflux. So just barely any significant reflux at all. We're trying to create a normal environment as much as possible. Uh, the results are not quite as good in neurologically impaired children, but in our hands, we have uh, results that are actually a little bit better than this, of course, here. Complication rates, this is a very honest range of 2 to 12% in the literature. We all think we do a really good job here and have much lower rate than that, uh, but some of the complications that we see are dysphagia or difficulty swallowing, or if the sutures uh, become undone uh, or break down the road, the wrap of the stomach can migrate or be disrupted. Some of the things we don't see as much anymore are gas bloat syndrome and dumping syndrome. Uh, and adhesive bowel obstruction is really, really rare now that we're not doing an open operation, that really everything we do is minimally invasive. So I'll uh, allow Dr. Kunisaki to take over and start sharing his screen to talk to you a bit about esophageal atresia. Great. <clears throat> I think you can see my slides. So um, in esophageal atresia, this is a, a very complex and major birth defect that affects about one in 3,500 or so uh, live births uh, in this country. In this condition, the esophagus uh, does not form as a continuous tube connecting the throat to the stomach. And instead, as shown by these diagrams, there's a, essentially a dead end in the esophagus uh, halfway down into the chest. As a result, uh, newborns cannot swallow any feeds when they are born and instead uh, gag, choke, and spit up uh, the saliva that uh, they naturally produce. Unfortunately, without treatment, babies with esophageal atresia will eventually die, even if a feeding tube, for example, is surgically placed directly into the stomach. And um, in a small group of kids that are born with esophageal atresia, the two ends of the esophagus are, are simply too far apart to connect them surgically uh, when they're born. And this is known as long gap esophageal atresia. Uh, the anatomy in these children who typically have long gap esophageal atresia is depicted here um, by those two um, uh, photographs uh, within the red box. Most children's hospitals, to be honest, are, are pretty good at repairing uh, most cases of esophageal atresia, but those with more complex anatomy, especially those with the long gap uh, variant, which I just talked about, um, these babies are, are the real challenge. You can't simply sew the two ends together unless you bring the lower part of the esophagus along <clears throat> with the stomach below it uh, into the chest. Otherwise, you would create a huge hiatal hernia and then create a new problem, which is essentially horrible gastroesophageal reflux disease. So instead, these patients um, really require surgical treatment that uh, mandates advanced techniques, which are unfortunately also higher risk, um, but they are required to successfully enable children to eat and swallow by, by mouth. And uh, these procedures include something um, called the Fokker procedure or stage traction procedure to help bring the two ends uh, of the esophagus together. Uh, some kids may even require more radical approaches uh, such as esophageal replacement. 
And even after a successful repair, complications after this kind of surgery are unfortunately quite common. And we get referrals uh, from patients who are kind of in this state. And uh, these complications include strictures, uh, vocal cord damage, as well as a floppy airway known as tracheal malacia. This slide just simply shows uh, some x-ray images of a child with long gap esophageal atresia who su was successfully managed by surgery and is now about five years old and is eating everything by mouth. On the left is an initial x-ray which shows an atresia uh, with a tube that uh, can't get past the really the level of the uh, clavicles and uh, there's no air at all within the entire uh, gastrointestinal tract. On the right is, is what's uh, known as a preoperative gap study, where we have these instruments that are used to um, define the upper and lower esophagus and um, under x-ray. And the gap between these two um, pieces of esophagus are quite large. Uh, I was fortunately able to repair this using the FOCA procedure, uh, but with a four month hospitalization stay, which is pretty common for long gap atresia. Uh, and ultimately a, a very good outcome. And so now I'll, I'll hand it over to Dr. Slidell to talk a little bit about um, other dysphagia or swallowing disorders. Thank you, Dr. Kunisaki. I will share my screen again with you. So there are really three main categories of um, esophageal disorders that can cause dysphagia in a child. And, and just to repeat something we said earlier, dysphagia is really the medical term that describes difficulty in swallowing food or liquids. And this may interfere with a child's ability to eat, drink, and gain weight appropriately. So the three main categories are intrinsic diseases that affect the inside uh, of the esophagus and may narrow the lumen or the opening inside of the esophagus. Categories of Intrinsic diseases include congenital problems like tracheobronchial cartilage within the esophageal wall, uh, inflammatory conditions or fibrosis, sometimes uh, neoplasms, but this is quite uncommon in a child. Uh, and then post-radiation therapy can lead to some scarring. So even if a child is a, uh, a non-esophageal uh, problem, they could have some scarring after radiation to the esophagus. Other things we unfortunately still see sometimes is caustic injection, uh, ingestion of uh, chemicals that uh, a child may mistake as juice or something in the home, leading to strictures. Uh, and then GERD, which we talked about earlier, can, if untreated, lead to peptic strictures or narrowing and scarring of the esophagus uh, that sometimes needs treatment. Extrinsically, as I alluded to earlier, tumors can cause extrinsic compression of the esophagus. Sometimes in other conditions, the lymph nodes become very enlarged around the esophagus and push on it. And then there are things uh, called vascular rings and slings, and that's a whole nother topic, but there are other extrinsic diseases that can affect uh, transit of liquid and foods through the esophagus. And then there are diseases within the esophageal tissue itself, and those processes can affect the peristalsis or the squeezing of food down through the esophagus, and they can affect uh, the lower esophageal sphincter, the LES, and the function of the LES by affecting the muscle within the esophagus. And this is a list of some of those. And the last one on the list is achalasia, and that's one of the topics I'm going to talk about next. So a typical patient with achalasia might be a 16-year-old or 13-year-old uh, with progressive dysphagia. It is a disease we can see in young children, but we tend not to see it in young children as much as we see it in teenagers. This child might have a history of several months duration of, of significant dysphagia, maybe vomiting undigested food, sometimes complaints of bad breath or, or coughing spells after meals. Uh, weight loss is common because of nutritional status affected as the food is just not getting down into the stomach. And sometimes they'll complain of pain in the sternum or the breastbone or burning, and that's from the irritation within the esophagus where that food is stuck. And what can happen over time is the nerves within the esophagus stop working, and that lower esophageal sphincter 
the opening at the bottom of the esophagus that connects the esophag esophagus, the feeding tube to the stomach, it doesn't open. It fails to relax and just won't open. So how do we work a child like this up? A uh, chest X-ray is, is probably the most common first thing that we would get, uh, followed by an upper GI series, as uh, we had mentioned before, with reflux disease. With some of these diagnoses, you can see this with an upper GI series, and you know what the diagnosis is right away. Uh, with achalasia, that is not the definitive test, but it will definitely give us a lot of diagnostic information leading us to the diagnosis. Endoscopy sometimes helps, and sometimes patients will come to us after seeing an endoscopist, but it doesn't always give us the full picture. The full picture really is dependent uh, on esophageal manometry combined with these other uh, tests that we talk about. And there's some cardinal features that we would see on esophageal manometry that really clinch the diagnosis for us. And these are a reduced or absent uh, peristalsis pattern in the esophagus. So the peristalsis is where the food is squeezed down into the stomach or failure of that sphincter between the esophagus and stomach, the LES sphincter, to relax and allow that food to pass down into the stomach when a child is swallowing. Some of the other findings are just changes in the pressure within the esophagus uh, and whether you see contractions in the esophagus. So what can we do aside from surgery? Well, there are some medications we can use to buy time, uh, typically while awaiting surgery. Unfortunately, these do not solve the problem or remove the problem, but they can uh, provide some relief of symptoms. Most common medication used in a child would be a calcium channel blocker. Uh, sometimes nitrates are, are given, not really for children, uh, but they do have good efficacy in adults. But again, this doesn't treat the problem itself. And... Uh, really are only useful in really severe cases where we're just trying to buy some time perhaps. And there are some risks to these medications as well. People have also used Botox to paralyze that uh, lower esophageal sphincter and allow it to relax to prevent that muscle from being spasmed closed. And this works, but unfortunately, as you know, Botox doesn't last forever. And so symptoms typically come back in four to six months. And from a surgeon's standpoint, the big problem with Botox is it makes surgery more difficult for us. It can cause scarring in that lower esophageal sphincter where we need to do surgery and make the eventual surgical correction more difficult and more dangerous for a patient. And so we don't love it when a patient has had a lot of Botox because it increases the risk for the patient and makes things more difficult for us. I'll talk a little bit about... Uh, surgery in a second, but the one other thing you may hear of is balloon dilation. This seems like an easy, simple solution, and you do get a relief typically up front, but the long-term durability of this, uh, of this procedure is not great compared to surgery. And so patients will have uh, a good period of dysphagia, often for a period of time, but over time, uh, the achalasia comes back and there is risk of perforation of the esophagus because you're really just stretching that, that constricted scar to esophagus, and if you stretch it too much, it can perforate. And then you also don't address the reflux that occurs after you open that up and acid is able to come back up, and sometimes that reflux can be pretty severe. Uh, the surgical approach, the classic approach, is something called a Heller myotomy. Myotomy is really what we're doing. We're cutting the muscle that has uh, constricted or narrowed and become uh, tight, and we're opening that up so food can pass back down through from the esophagus into the stomach. And this has really good success rates and long-term success rates, especially when it's paired with a partial fundoplication. Fundoplication is the same word you heard earlier when we spoke about a Nissen fundoplication. This is a different version of that uh, fundoplication that we use in this type of surgery. Patients do really well. They have very small scars, uh, about five millimeter at, at the most, and they usually go home on the second day after surgery on a soft diet. You also may hear of something called POEM. Uh, POEM technically is something that can achieve the same initial success rate as a Heller myotomy, but overall, uh, seems to have slightly higher long-term uh, adverse uh, complications. And really, the reflux is not treated with POEM. And so when we do that door 
partial fundoplication that I mentioned, that prevents the reflux. And so the problem, the challenge really with POEM is how do we, how do we deal with the reflux? Some patients seem to not get it, uh, but we're not really sure how to choose exactly which patient uh, would benefit from a POEM versus uh, the myotomy. So I'm going to stop sharing and allow Dr. Kunisaki to talk to you a little bit about esophageal strictures. Thanks, Mark. So the uh, fourth group and the final group of esophageal disorders to discuss in this webinar um, are esophageal strictures. A stricture is simply a, a narrowing involving a part of the esophagus. And uh, this is a problem because it leads to difficulty swallowing food, even liquids, uh, if the stricture is bad enough. Common causes of esophageal strictures include uh, congenital strictures that kids are born with, strictures that form as scar tissue after esophageal surgery, uh, strictures caused by chronic damage from untreated gastroesophageal reflux disease, and then finally, esophageal masses either in the wall of the esophagus itself or coming from just outside the esophagus. Unfortunately, esophageal strictures are, are sometimes uh, not that straightforward to diagnose, uh, and can be confused with functional problems of the esophagus, like achalasia, which Dr. Seidel just talked about, or other rare problems like eosinophilic esophagitis, which is an allergic condition involving the esophagus that usually responds quite nicely to medical therapies. One type of esophageal narrowing that we see in older infants and toddlers is something called congenital esophageal stenosis, or CES, in CES, the narrowing occurs towards the bottom of the esophagus and is caused by uh, abnormal formation of extra muscle or cartilage tissue. The classic presentation is the infant who is learning how to eat solids for the first time, usually between six and nine months of age, and experiences severe choking and gagging episodes because the food keeps getting stuck at the bottom of the esophagus. Most kids require a thorough uh, investigation, which includes an upper GI contrast study, as well as endoscopy, and sometimes CT scan to make sure that the cause isn't from a mass nearby. And over the past two decades, we've really seen a remarkable evolution in the management of these uh, with a preference for endoscopic therapies, such as um, um, uh, exciting technologies like needle knife, uh, which can cut the narrowing from the inside of the esophagus using an endoscope, as well as more traditional treatments like uh, serial balloon dilation. Another cause for esophageal narrowing uh, that we tend to see in older kids is an esophageal duplication cyst. These are benign masses that grow right next to the esophagus to cause the narrowing. Like CES, uh, they usually affect the bottom of the esophagus, but can also cause narrowings elsewhere. Uh, leading to progressive problems with swallowing, and in many cases, uh, pretty substantial weight loss. Uh, these are typically evaluated using an esophagram as well as a CT scan. And um, we see a few of these every year, and uh, these are typically handled in a minimally invasive fashion using keyhole surgery, sometimes with a robot in older kids, and is uh, usually successful in completely eliminating the swallowing problem. Um, these are just before and after pictures in the operating room of an esophageal duplication cyst treated uh, with thoracoscopic removal. Uh, we typically repair the esophageal wall shown here on the right by those uh, kind of purplish sutures to prevent long-term complications with swallowing. And in this slide, these are esophagrams before surgery on the left and on the right after surgery showing complete restoration of a wide open esophagus as shown by uh, the yellow arrow. Before Dr. Slidell concludes uh, this talk, uh, I just wanna share this slide, which I think really illustrates how our group here at Johns Hopkins Children's Center is uh, known as an academic leader in the country in terms of pediatric esophageal care. Um, these are just a snapshot of, of recent articles that 
have been published in the last three years or so in major medical and surgical journals, covering a, a wide range of topics from minimally invasive repair for esophageal atresia to the management of long gap esophageal atresia, achalasia, among others. Our esophageal surgery program is also one of a handful of centers in the country that is funded by the National Institutes of Health, or NIH, to explore innovative treatments using 3D printed technologies. Um, so as you can see, I think we have a very robust program here at Johns Hopkins. So I will stop sharing. So in summary, just want to emphasize that uh, esophageal diseases, while rare, uh, they are often very complex within the realm of uh, surgery. These problems we really feel should be treated by pediatric specialists with dedicated expertise to obtain the best possible long-term outcomes. And really this, this is highly dependent on a multidisciplinary collaborative approach. Uh, and we're really proud of, of our team here and, and having everybody here with expertise in these esophageal disorders. The multidisciplinary perspective on uh, addressing these problems and diagnosing these problems, I think really goes a long way to choosing the correct approach for each child. And we really customize that uh, for each infant or adolescent or teenager as they come through the door and, and we meet them. We have a particular emphasis on minimally invasive treatments because we really think that in most cases, maybe not all, but in most cases, this will have a great benefit for the child as far as healing and scarring is concerned. And some of those involve endoscopic therapies, minimally invasive surgical therapy, and robotic surgery. We will now proceed with our Q&A session. If anyone has any questions they would like to present, uh, we'd be happy to take those on. If you do have questions uh, or would like to talk to us and follow up, the best way to reach us is through the information on this screen. Kathy Baldino is our advanced nurse practitioner who works with us in the esophageal clinic, and she can help coordinate some of that for us. I also like to highlight our ongoing partnership with Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital, especially for the airway uh, problems that we see when patients have esophageal problems that are impacting the airway. Uh, and All Children's Hospital is the Johns Hopkins Hospital in Florida. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen here and uh, the rest of our team will come on and see if we have any questions in the chat here. Uh, so question number one, how is the Children's Center working with All Children's Hospital uh, in Florida uh, for airway problems? And question two is, how does multidisciplinary care benefit patients? Dr. Kunisaki, do you want to take the first part of that question? Yeah, sure. I'd be happy to, Dr. Sledell. Yeah, so um, both institutions uh, are... Johns Hopkins affiliated, and um, we do have a, a formal collaboration with all children's. Uh, it just so happens that uh, also a good personal friend, but a colleague over the years uh, is um, uh, Dr. Jason Smithers, who is the head of the um, esophageal and airway treatment uh, program there. Um, they have tremendous expertise in um, the surgical management of severe um, tracheal malacia. Um, one of the broadest in the country. And so it would be, um, and so for, for those types of airway cases, we have uh, regularly scheduled multidisciplinary, actually um, Zoom meetings where we, we talk about uh, these kinds of cases and how to best uh, uh, manage that. And that includes um, as well, um, actually a surgeon from here going down to all children's and, and vice versa, uh, for some of the more complex cases. And so I think having a Johns Hopkins campus uh, in the northern part 
uh, as well as in the southern part, is is helped to broaden our reach to to help take care of um, sort of these complex patients, and uh, collaborations uh, uh, continue to be ongoing, uh, sort of in that uh, venture. Yeah, I, I really think that's a key part of it. That multidisciplinary care that uh, the second question is getting at is the the ability for us to put many heads together to come up with the best solution tailored for the individual patient's problem. One of the other nice things that we have is, is it's not just a handful of surgeons and gastroenterologists and ENT uh, folks working on these problems, but we have the advantage of uh, multidisciplinary conferences and uh, weekly meetings where we can talk about difficult or challenging cases. And so that collaboration really extends very broadly uh, beyond even just uh, the obvious collaboration of maybe the two surgeons and gastroenterologists taking care of an individual patient. And so I think that multidisciplinary and collaborative approach uh, really gets the best answer for each particular child. Uh, the third question is, uh, is there a particular age range uh, that are of patients diagnosed with esophageal conditions most commonly? This really varies tremendously on the problem that we're seeing. For example, achalasia, we tend not to see in, in newborn babies. Uh, that's really a problem we tend to see in adolescents and teenagers. Whereas obviously congenital esophageal atresia is a congenital problem that we will see right at birth. Sometimes we will manage those patients for their whole life, but that's a problem that will present much earlier. So the age range is highly dependent on the specific disease process we are talking about. Uh, Dr. Kunisaki, do you wanna do the next one? Is there any special preparation before esophageal surgery? Yeah, sure, I'd be happy to. I think that the short answer is it really just depends on the type of problem. I would say in terms of preparation, other than getting the adequate diagnostic tests, which can be done at Johns Hopkins or, or locally where you are. Um, oftentimes, uh, there is preparation that is required from a nutritional standpoint. I, think, I would say the most common scenario would be the child with uh, pretty substantial achalasia. Um, some children can present with 20 to 30 pounds of weight loss if they're a teenager before the diagnosis is made and a treatment plan is uh, is devised moving forward. And so um, as a result of that, uh, sometimes they need to have um, preoperative nutrition, uh, sometimes uh, nutrition by vein or TPN in order to uh, decrease the risks of um, perioperative uh, surgery. So I would say that's a, a unique subset, but it really depends on the um, pathology. But nutrition obviously is, is a major concern given the esophagus's role in terms of swallowing. Thank you. I'll take the next question. Question five that has shown up is what kind of support is provided during the hospital stay at the Children's Center? So this is one of the things that is most incredible about children's hospitals is that they are hospitals dedicated to children, obviously, but we don't take care of adult patients in this hospital. And the whole environment, the entire built environment is geared around children, adolescents, teenagers. Granted, we do have some young patients who are in their early 20s who are having ongoing care, uh, but the built environment is really geared towards children. So everything from the entrance to the hospital, uh, to the elevators, to the operating room suites, to the rooms, is geared to make it a comfortable environment, a welcoming environment for a child and their family. And the families are able to stay in the room with the child. Obviously, we can't have, uh, you know, 30 family members in a single room, but we do have a, a space for parents to stay with a child or visitors to take turns staying with a child so that they are not alone throughout this process. One of the other things that I think we do incredibly well uh, is make the child comfortable during the hospitalization. And at every step where we have noted that a child might have uh, discomfort, say, a having an IV placed or going to sleep for surgery, we have child life specialists who are available who can be there and help with distracting techniques and other ways to prepare a child 
so that they know what to expect and make it an easier uh, experience for them. So there, there is a whole host of things that we do. Those are just some of the things, but really this is an incredibly welcoming environment for a child, uh, given that we're talking about a hospital uh, and that this, this environment really is geared towards the child more than anything. And everyone who works here, they only take care of children. Uh, the next question I'll pass to you, Dr. Kunisaki, what can parents expect for aftercare with surgery? Yeah, sure. I mean, again, it depends a little bit about what the precise problem is, and it really varies depending on uh, the, the disease process. For long gap esophageal atresia, for example, you know, these patients are, are typically in the hospital for three months or so, or, or can be in the hospital for three months, sometimes longer. And so after a, that kind of surgery, um, we often have multidisciplinary meetings. Um, with the various uh, specialists to come up with a treatment plan. And oftentimes uh, we actually have family meetings on regular basis with the with uh, family members to sort of update them and to address uh, complications uh, moving forward or, or issues with complications moving forward. Uh, sometimes uh, we accomplish these virtually as well as in person. There are many esophageal disorders, fortunately, though, that we were able to treat purely with endoscopy. And in the vast majority of endoscopic cases, those are actually outpatient uh, procedures. So the aftercare takes place um, at home or uh, someplace locally. And um, they usually require some uh, temporary diet modification in some cases uh, with medications, but oftentimes uh, families are able to resume uh, normal diet is, is, um, uh, in terms of feeding their their child. So it can vary quite a bit. And again, it's a tailored approach depending on the pathology at hand. I will take the next question, which is, are there any limitations during the recovery process? Well, as you might expect, this will depend a little bit on uh, what procedure a child is undergoing. So for example, a child who has a stricture in their esophagus that we are able to balloon open uh, and, and it looks like it will open quite nicely, that child will really have minimal uh, restrictions. We might test to make sure they're able to tolerate some liquids before feeding them. But the goal would be to take a child who perhaps has difficulty eating solid foods and move them towards that right away after surgery, if that's the uh, procedure of a balloon dilation. Whereas with a larger operation, uh, maybe an open thoracic, uh, um, thoracic operation where we have to make a larger incision, a child may not be able to eat for several days, and there may be other limitations imposed during the recovery. Uh, so it's, it really is tailored to the surgery and to the child on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, I think if there was a specific question on that, we would be able to answer that more precisely. But the, the limitations are tailored to the situation at hand. And sometimes they're small and sometimes they're, they are greater. Uh, the next one, Dr. Kunisaki, I'll pass to you. Are there any complications with robotic surgery? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, first and foremost, I want to say that robotic surgery is a standard of care for many disorders that we treat in surgery. It certainly grew out of the vast experience um, in adults, and particularly in urology, but in, and also in um, general surgery disciplines. But um, so the technology for robotic surgery has been quite advanced and is at a very high level for the last, really for the last decade <clears throat> and, and perhaps longer. But obviously, there are concerns about robotic surgery because, as with any technical procedure, you're not only introducing risks for human error, but also um, issues poten potentially related to mechanical failure of the robot itself. Fortunately, this has been fairly well studied, and um, the, the complications associated with robotic surgery are, are very low. And in general, robotic surgery is very safe. And so that generally is not a concern. What the robot allows us to do is to do things much more easily 
um, and with better, higher dexterity than we could do with a purely laparoscopic approach. So there aren't really specific complications of robotic surgery that I would say are unique to surgery in general, um, despite the fact that we have this um, this this extra element of, of, of a machine that's actually helping us to uh, do surgery easier. I think we'll just keep trading questions back and forth. So I'll take the next one. Uh, what are the side effects of balloon dilation? So typically we're doing balloon dilation for a patient with a stricture and uh, that process involves a, an endoscope or a scope going through the mouth into the esophagus in the case of uh, esophageal strictures. And then we will inflate a balloon or fill up a balloon with a fluid that we can see on x-rays live as we are inflating it. And we will see the stricture as we expand that balloon. So we will see the stricture pushing away and, and opening up. And we try to calibrate how much we push it based on a lot of factors such as has the child had a balloon dilation in the past? What size balloon was used? How large, um, how large a balloon was used at the final uh, push to enlarge it? And we just try to incrementally increase the size of the opening to avoid complications. And so the side effects uh, really are maybe that a child might see a little bit of blood uh, briefly in their sputum if they spit anything up, but typically they don't because we've dilated and, and everything can go back down. Uh, children don't really have pain per se after uh, balloon dilation. Uh, they tend to feel better than they did before. Obviously, there are some really severe cases uh, that it might be a little bit different, but that they tend to just feel uh, better and, and the side effects are minimal from that. Um, you know, the biggest complication risk is a perforation, which I mentioned earlier when we were talking about balloon dilation for achalasia, but that's very uncommon. And I think especially in the hands of uh, surgeons and endoscopists who uh, are very cognizant of where a child has come from before surgery and how much we want to dilate at this particular episode, uh, it's become an infrequent, uh, pretty rare occurrence. I will pass the next one to you, Dr. Kunisaki, which is what are some of the complications of esophageal duplication cysts? Yeah, thanks. Just to add on to what Dr. Slidell said, you know, the side effects of, of balloon dilation uh, really also vary based on the pathology. So the condition that's notoriously associated with, with bad complications actually are these congenital esophageal stenosis uh, patients who are known to have a higher risk for perforation. So, uh, you know, I just want to echo the fact that, um, you know, experience with these unique conditions and pathologies, I think is, is really important so that you, you minimize the number of procedures, dilations that's required uh, without um, getting into side effects. In terms of the question with regards to the complications associated with esophageal duplication cysts, um, the major long-term uh, risks are recurrence if the entire duplication cyst is not removed. Sometimes there are situations where you simply really can't remove it or it's not worth removing all of it. You can remove maybe 90% of it um, and, and leave a, a small part uh, behind. And so there is a, a risk of recurrence in those settings. That's fortunately pretty uncommon. And then if you remove the duplication cysts and uh, you leave a, a large portion of the esophagus exposed, uh, meaning um, that it's uh, thin and, and not properly brought back together, you can what's called uh, get what's called a diverticulum or a little um, outpouching or a ballooning of the esophagus um, with swallowing, and you can actually get stuff caught in it years down the road, which which I have seen. And so there are complications associated with it, but again, fortunately, they're pretty rare. So in terms of the, the last question uh, in the seminar, it says here, um, do you see more minimally invasive procedures in the future for esophageal conditions? And I think the short answer is yes. So one of the limitations of minimal invasive surgery, particularly in children, has been um, 
just how technically challenging some of these procedures are. The esophagus actually is, is one of the more delicate structures uh, within um, the gastrointestinal tract as a very thin wall, and it's located next to some pretty um, important structures it being situated near the heart and the lungs. And so that surgery in and of itself just makes it very challenging. Um, but <clears throat> I think we're going to continue to see both endoscopic uh, technologies advance that will allow us, for example, to do um, things that we would never think of doing or that we can only do in adults currently because the instrumentation just simply isn't small enough or fine enough to do in smaller children. And similarly, um, advances in robotic surgery, I think will continue to advance again with uh, miniaturizing the instruments so that uh, we can use uh, smaller incisions in order to accomplish things that otherwise just didn't really seem worth it, uh, at least in the, in the smaller age uh, populations. And so I think those advances are really in the horizon in the short term, you know, let's say in the next five years or so. So I think we're going to continue to see um, minimally invasive uh, therapies uh, being adopted. You know, we always have to temper that enthusiasm, though, because um, it, particularly with children, the long-term effects and outcomes of these studies, um, you know, do take time to to really appreciate and understand. Because we're we're doing these therapies in children who hopefully have 70, 80 years ahead of them, we want to make sure that long-term, what we do as surgeons is technically sound and, and lasting. But uh, I, I'm very enthusiastic for it, and uh, I look forward to um, adopting some of these as we move forward. So I think we're uh, wrapping up now. Thank you for those fantastic questions, really some great questions we received. Uh, we both hope that this has been useful and informative. And if you do have further questions, we'd be happy to, to speak to you during an appointment. Uh, the number is there on the, the bottom of the slide, uh, or you can find us through the internet. Uh, but thank you very much for taking the time to listen, and hopefully this was useful. Thank you.